As old soldiers, it is our duty to do everything possible to bring back those lost on the battlefield so that they can be laid to rest in peace and bring closure for family and friends as they would have done for us, lest we forget. When we started the PVO, Paravet Veterans Organisation, just over five years ago, I was then the communications officer. I suggested at that time that we try and uh, locate and bring Scully's humans, human remains back. He had been lost and nobody knew where he was. Well, you know, the, the Americans are, are still bringing people back from Vietnam now. You know, they, they had lots of missing in action people there. And uh, they've got one unit that just brings people home. And it's very well funded. They have these phenomenal dogs, sniffer dogs, that can find 50-year-old graves. They're absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and they're doing it because they know it needs to be done. There had been some tours up to Kasinga, battlefield tours, and there were rumors coming back that somebody had met somebody who had met somebody who heard that Scully had been found and that he'd been buried. So that's all the information we had at that stage. So I formulated a rather harebrained plan to try and scan the banks of the river in the area where we believed that he would have fallen. And, and really, the, the more information that came through, the more harebrained this plan appeared to be. The plan initially was to get uh, below ground radar, a scan for a, for a hidden grave, do a scan with metal detectors uh, to see if we could pick up rifles, helmets, dog tags, that kind of thing. Of course, the area to be scanned, we had no idea which side of the river it was on from the rumors that we'd heard. So it was going to be a hell of a big area. And really, in retrospect, it wouldn't have been successful. However, in the meantime, we got a message from another battlefield tour. And it wasn't South Africans who'd gone up. It was actually Namibians who'd gone up. One chap by the name of uh, Gordon McGregor was a, a historian. And he was on a trip with, with a few mates going up there. And because he was a historian, he was quite interested in the, in the Battle of Kasinga. And he, uh, they had an interpreter there because, you know, all they do is speak Portuguese up there. And they questioned some of the locals who, who were hanging about. And uh, one of the locals said, uh, my father actually found a South African paratrooper in the water and pulled him out and buried him. So Gordon McGregor then said to the guy, well, is your father still alive? And he said, yes, he's alive and he lives right down where the body was found, which was about three, four kilometers away from, from the center of the base. So they visited the father. He said, yes, he remembers it well. He was called to the riverside by some young kids five days after the battle saying there's something in the water. And uh, he saw this parachute uh, sort of floating along and pulled on it and found a body at the end of it. And he pulled it out and uh, examined the body. He said there weren't any bullet holes. So it, it seems as though he, he had definitely drowned. And we had, of course, only lost one guy, um, the the other three guys who were killed at Kasinga, we had taken back. So this could only have been Scully. Gordon McGregor then asked the guy to take him to a grave uh, where he had buried uh, Scully. And he said he'd buried him sort of waist deep, not a, not a six foot deep hole. Gordon then got a GPS uh, reading of the actual grave site. And we got some photographs of it. He then went home uh, back to Vintook. The story sort of leaked out. It, it wasn't announced or anything like that. And, and I got uh, a message from, from one of the chaps who was with me at Kasinga, uh, the guy I mentioned who had actually also fallen into the river. 
um, but swam, swam out. He jettisoned his gear and he swam out. And he'd heard and got some photographs of the supposed gravesite that Scully had been found. So, you know, immediately I chased up with, with Gordon McGregor and he sent me a, a, an exhaustive letter um, describing, you know, exactly what the old man had told him. So now we actually had something that we could really move on. It was unclear to me how, how we could start this thing because obviously it required uh, all sorts of permissions from uh, Angola, first of all, Namibia to transport the body through, South Africa, the South African uh, embassy and the foreign affairs people needed to be notified and also we needed their approval and Botswana because we would be transiting Botswana as well. So uh, this was a sort of quite a mountain to climb and I was told uh, by somebody that I had to go through uh, a chap by the name of General Gert Oppermann who had run previously um, the EBO4 project. So I got hold of uh, General Oppermann and, and I went to meet with him and showed him all the evidence. And he said, yeah, you know, he's, he's quite keen on, on doing this, but it's going to require quite a lot of money. He said about 350,000 rand, um, because that's more or less what they spent on the EBO thing with a bit of inflation. And then he told me, the uh, problems that they'd had with the, the Ebo program. They had uh, problems with the Angolan police. I think they were arrested once or twice. They were thrown off site and, and all sorts of things. So this made it even more daunting, but uh, if General Oppermann was happy to take it on, of course, uh, so were we as the PVO. And General Oppermann explained that he had to get hold of various departments before he even went to, to the Angolan. So he said it's going to take some time. I think the Ebo thing took about 13 years before they actually got going. He said, okay, leave it to me, uh, which I did. Well, after a year, I, I got hold of him and I said, you know, well, what's the progress? And he said, well, very little. So I said, I'd like to take the program back. Coincidentally, at the same time, a chap by the name of Eben Barlow phoned me and uh, he was the, the head of uh, Executive Outcomes Mercenary Paid Army who had operated in Angola. And uh, he said to me, uh, listen, I've got somebody who might well be able to help you. He's an ex-MK guy, country with Caesar, so, so very much an ex-enemy of ours. But he said he's, he's got uh, experience on, on bringing bodies back from Zambia and, uh, and Angola. So uh, even introduced us, we had lunch together. He was just as concerned about the, the next of kin of our people as he was of his. And he said, with pleasure, he'll help. Being an ex-MK guy, he was actually a colonel at the time. Uh, he's since retired. But he knew absolutely everybody in the ANC, anybody of, of any kind of uh, value um, or Blas knew. Blas is his war name, by the way. Just within weeks, we had the permissions that we required from the from the South African government. Blas was also very well connected with the Angolan government. Uh, I said to Blas, listen, we, we need to really get this Angolan thing going properly. We don't want to get arrested by police, et cetera, et cetera, when we go up there. So he said, uh, no problem. He knows the Angolan ambassador to South Africa, and he'll go and speak to her. So Blas went along to the Angolan ambassador and uh, she said, yeah, she, she's happy to help, but could we help her in exchange? So Blas phoned me and he said, listen, are you willing to, to help the Angolan ambassador? I said, absolutely, you know, whatever I can do. So he came back with a story that one of the women who worked for the ambassador at the embassy had a husband missing in action who was fighting him on the Angolan side. And he went missing in action at, uh, at an action at a place called Zangonga in 1981, I think it was. So it was much later than Kasinga. The Angolans believed, because he was a captain, that he'd been captured. And they were very unhappy with us because we hadn't given him back at the end of hostilities. So they believed that we'd captured this guy and, and just hadn't 
given him back or he died in captivity or something. And they wanted to know what had happened. I got working on it right away because I believed it very important for the Skilly Project to find some kind of answers on this. We had a picture. The wife gave us a picture of Captain Geronimo. Eventually, after you know speaking to everybody from the Secret Service to the Reckies to the, the 32 Battalion, and nobody had heard of this guy, I heard of the story of this tank being shot out at Zangongo, which was the first tank um, in this particular battle. And a guy by the name of Tofi Hrovir had shot this tank out uh, with a rattle, 90 mil uh, heat round. Spoke to Tofi, and he said, yeah, as far as he knew, that was the only tank that was shot out that day. Now, the Angolans knew exactly the day that this guy had disappeared. And this was the same day. Tofi Hrovir wasn't much help as to what had happened because he shot this tank out and he he went off into battle and uh, actually got the Honoris crooks for shooting out another tank the next day. But he had no idea what what had happened to the people in that tank. But he did say to me, listen, there's this guy, Reki guy, who had been tasked with demining it or de-booby trapping the tank. And I got hold of him, and he told me the story. It was a Russian tank, and Toffee had shot it in the uh, in the turret. This Reki, who had uh, examined the tank, said he climbed up on the turret and opened the hatch, and he said, there's a hell of a mess in there. Um, so he called a medic to come and take the remains out, because the medic climbed up on top of the tank and had one look into the uh, into the hash and got such a fright he fell off and broke his leg. Guy in the turret had been totally decapitated with the spray of molten metal. The driver and the gunner, uh, who were lower down in the tank underneath the turret, had climbed out of their hatches but had died right next to the tank. So those two bodies had been found by the Angolans. But the third body of the tank commander, Captain Geronimo, had not been found. And the reason why is that the South Africans had decided to capture that tank and take it home. So what happened was a driver was assigned to the tank and told to to drive it out on on a compass bearing to a a lager that night and meet the rest of the, the South African armor and uh, they would take it home. So this guy did climb into the tank and and drove it off. And he said the next morning he decanted the remains of Captain Geronimo out of the turret and buried it in a a very shallow grave. And then they were off. And they brought the tank back to South Africa. So I traced the tank to the Army College in Pretoria. So Blas and I, we went to the Army College and the first tank we got to was, in fact, Captain Geronimo's uh, tank. And we could see the, the hole in the side of the turret. And there was even a brass plaque told us that it had been shot out at Zangonga on that particular day. We now had answers. They said, no, it made complete sense as far as they were concerned. Uh, they were happy with it. The serial number of the tank was... It was his tank. This gave us, I think, quite a good uh, grounding for a good relationship. We could then approach the Angolan people in Luanda to get the permissions we required. Uh, They were all very positive, but very little happened. It was actually very difficult to, to get pieces of paper from them to say, please give these guys safe passage. In the meantime... We felt that it was also very important to get the Namibians uh, on a friendly basis because, after all, although this action had taken place in Angola, it was essentially Namibians who were killed. And uh, Blas, again, was was of of great value because he knew the military attaché at the um, uh, Namibian High Commission in Pretoria. So we went and visited uh, the Namibian High Commission. I don't know if, if I mentioned, but Gordon McGregor, when he had spoken to the old man who buried Scully, had said he had found two corpses. 
One was of a black soldier who had been shot, and one was of Skilly, and he buried them quite close to one another. So we could only presume that uh, one of our guys had shot him, and this is what the old man found. When we went to the Namibian High Commission, we explained the story, and he said, when we visited him in his office, he said, just give me a moment, and he called somebody, and he brought this guy through to his office, and this guy was, in fact, one of the fellows who had been tasked to clean up after the Kasinga battle. So he had been there, and then I told them about their missing soldier, and they had never heard of it. So I said to them, listen, when when we go up, I'm very willing to exhume his remains and bring them back to Namibia, if you wish, or rebury them where the mass grave of all the, the other dead soldiers are, so you know where he is, or I'll make up a headstone and put it on the grave where he is now, so that when you guys go up to build your Kasinga Memorial, which they're planning to do, you can uh, um, exhume him and, and be. And uh, they, they chose that. And I've made a headstone, which we'll take up there. So we now had a, a situation, a very really strange situation, where we started off with one missing in action, and now I ended up with three missing in actions from three different armies. It was a situation where we could work for everybody's uh, well-being on this thing, not just a South African soldier. We now started getting everything together. Uh, so I decided I'm going to contact the new president. And I wrote the president a letter explaining everything. Um, we then got some action and he put a ministerial task force together. Eventually, just before the COVID shutdown, we were ready to go. And then the borders were closed. You know, after all of these years of, of waiting, so on and so forth, we had to postpone it. I started the process again. So it, it, it's still a bit of a process because we've got to get people from Luanda to come down, um, government officials to come down to witness the exhumation. We've got to get a local priest. We've got to get the local mayor. We've got to get the local doctor. We're taking two undertakers. So it's still a bit of a process, but we're almost there. And, and hopefully the minute the, the borders open completely, we'll be able to go. Uh, the one complication is, is that uh, the big rains come uh, in November. So I don't know whether we're going to be able to do it in time before the rains come. So we may have to postpone until maybe around about April next year. So that's more or less where we stand in the in the Brings Kalyan project. Actually, Mike, I think it's incredible that the persistence and the commitment that yourself and even what amazes me more is that you've got collaboration on the other side. And it's like there is a mutual respect for the mission that you are attempting to execute. Like there was the initial mission, which was the Battle of Kasinga, but then it's the recognition from all combatants that this needs to be done and done right. And the fact that throughout all of these roadblocks that you've had to endure, all the administrative complexity and challenges, that you're still now at the point where you're ready to execute and lo and behold, you get a COVID pandemic to throw the final spanner in the works. But I'm sure just through what you have achieved in life that you will achieve this objective, which is a credit to yourself and to the people that you're working with. But I, what I think it's amazing is the goodwill. Can you explain to me how you got to that stage where the goodwill of a combatant ended up being the same as yours and the collaboration? Can you explain that bit? It's very difficult to explain. I, I'm not sure I know the reason apart from the fact that, you know, we, we spoke about the brotherhood of, of paratroopers, um, but there's also a very strong brotherhood between combatants, funnily enough, uh, well after the fact, obviously. But you've both been through hell, 
You've both been been fighting for things that haven't really turned out the way you wished it oh, on both sides. So, you know, the poor soldier is, is sort of sandwiched between these political problems and and they, they develop a, a kinship between one another. I've told uh, Blas that I'm very happy to, to get involved in retrieving the many bodies of ANC and MK people who were killed in their camps in Angola because there's something like 200 of their people who haven't been repatriated, you know, and, and I think that's a, a scandal. You know, we'll, we'll pull together to, to get these guys back and they know where they're buried. I mean, we don't have to, to go and search for the graves, you know, and uh, they were all buried with, with bottles with their names and, and war names, et cetera, et cetera, in the bottle next to the, the body. So it's simply that these things must be done. They, they really have to be done, and that's the way the paratroopers feel about Scully. We as paratroopers are in a, a peculiar position in that our fighting happens behind enemy lines. Now, compare that to a normal infantryman who gets killed on the lines. Now, he has lines of ambulances, field hospitals, big hospitals, um, helicopters to get him to help. We don't. When our guys are killed, they're killed far behind enemy lines, and it is our responsibility to take them back. And if you don't take that seriously, you're not going to end up with a very, how can I say, motivated crew. You know, you, you need to know that your buddies are going to look after you, uh, living or dead. I mean, you could be wounded as well, but those guys must take you home. Um, and without that implicit promise, you know, you, you can't produce first-class troops. So even though it's now 40 years later, it's still just as important to get the guy home than it was at, on the day of the battle. It's just as important, if not more important as far as we're concerned. I think it, this applies to everybody um, to a certain degree, paratroopers in particular because of our circumstances, but uh, to, to the ANC, to MK, to the Angolans, you know, everybody's concerned about missing in action, the horrible business. You know, you, you're uncertain about everything. You don't know whether the next knock on the door is going to, to be your loved one. It's that adage of no one gets left behind it's the ultimate in camaraderie, isn't it? Absolutely. That you know no one gets left behind. Yeah, and we left Scully behind, and that's got to be undone. Mark, the MK soldier, do you have any idea of who he is, or will you try and identify him when, when you get there? No, 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 he's, sorry, he's not MK. He, he was um, most probably planned People's Liberation Army of Namibia or Swapo. No, we have no idea, and that's why we went to to speak to the guys at the High Commission. They had no idea. You see, I don't think their record keeping was that fantastic at Kasinga. One of the, the big reasons were because it was a transit camp. So you had guys coming in in the late of night and maybe leaving the next morning in some instances, you know, in their hundreds. They had no idea who was really missing and who wasn't. They, they buried 600 to 1,000 of them uh, after the battle. So they had no idea that this guy, you know, was in a lonely grave four kilometers away. Uh, so it was news to them as well. It would almost be impossible to identify him unless he had identification tags or whatever on him. We think that both Scully and he would have been stripped of all of their valuable. You know, it's a very poor area there. A pair of boots is, you know, like gold. You know, in Scully's instance, we know, for instance, that he had lost two front teeth in a parachuting accident, surprisingly enough, from some years before. Uh, so we can uh, possibly identify the skull with the two front teeth and, and maybe the, the dentures if they're still there. He was wrapped in a, in a piece of parachute, the old man tells us. Um, we know that his rifle had gone because the old man told Swapo, who were cleaning up the camp, about this. And they came and had a look at him, took his rifle, took his gear, just said, oh, man, listen, just bury him here. So the Swapo guy, 
he's an unknown soldier, and I think he always will be. I'm just keen to get an understanding from your perspective, Mike, as to why do you think there was so much red tape and a reluctance to help you to bring one of your own back home after a significant battle? Why do you think that would be the case? These things do move very slowly. You know, I was just a a rifleman. So I think a lot of the problems with the South African government were, were historical problems that I didn't really encounter. The the problems with the Angolan government were just inertia. It wasn't a battle with them. It was on their territory. You know, there weren't any Angolans killed or whatever. It goes onto the top of the pile in the inbox and it stays there. Um, Unless you've got somebody up there to help, and and we do. Um, We have an Angolan guy in Luanda, and he's been tirelessly pushing for this. And he knows a a lawyer whose son works in the president's office. And that's how we got the letter to the president in his hands. Had we not had that connection, uh, it would have sat in somebody else's inbox. So there there are a number of people who've really worked selflessly and tirelessly for no reward through the goodness of their hearts to help on this project. Once you get Scully's remains back, what are the plans? Are we going to have a big ceremony? Because they're going to probably be pretty emotional for the unit. I'm in constant contact with his widow, Rachel Human, and she is, of course, 100% behind this project. We have organized through General Opperman that in the, in the big wall at Fort Trekker Monument, uh, there are a number of niches on the side of the wall one or two of which were used for the uh, Ebo remains, they have reserved one of those niches for, for Scully. So, yeah, we will have a, a parade at the Fort Trekker Monument at the wall, and he, his remains will be interred there. Rachel, on the other hand, you know, it's entirely up to her, but the option of the wall with all the rest of the guys who were killed, I, I think, from my point of view, is, is the best. But obviously, she's the uh, she's the one who makes the big decision. One thing I would like to say is the raising of the money for the project. That has also obviously been mainly from paratroopers. There was an RLI guy, and he came up with the idea of creating a, a, a box, a wooden box, which would be put on bars, um, moth club bars and uh, military type bars all around the world with the story of Scully on the box, and it's called Buy Scully a Drink. So the idea is when you buy yourself a drink, you deposit the money that uh, would have bought Scully a drink into the box. And uh, we've got boxes in Scotland, in Australia, all over the place. A considerable amount of the money required has been collected through those boxes. So... That's another nice story Fantastic. because Aurelia is Rhodesian, you know, the the guy who who, who brought it up and um, created the idea was, was from a Rhodesian military uh, unit. It's just been, you know, goodwill all around, uh, absolutely amazing. And that really shines through. It is very, the whole thing is about goodwill. And often in war and battles, uh, the perception from outside is that it's all about it's it's evil, it's bad. It is it is. There's no doubt about it. War is a really tough, tough place, and the ultimate in last resorts. But what I find is amazing through the story that you've told around Scully and this whole unity that has brought all the combatants and even even fellow soldiers from around the world who had no part in this battle, knew nobody in this battle, but feel an obligation that they need to support this effort because it is that ethos that nobody is left behind and the next of kin need to be put at ease and there needs to be closure to all these episodes. I think that's an amazing takeaway from this battle and how the learnings, but there is that emotional connection that long survives the negativity of the actual battle itself. 
and it shows that through a, a very traumatic experience for all, all parties, that there is a positive experience at the end. And the positive experience lasts significantly longer and is enduring more so than what the initial event was. You know, Poppy Day is, is one of the most well-known manifestations of that. People celebrate it almost all over the world. And people who often don't have much contact with, with anybody who was uh, involved in in the First or Second World War. But yeah, there, there are things that, that lived much longer than the results of the wars. The Scully Project is, is important in that even though we may find nothing, uh, we know that we may find nothing. Shallow graves in Africa are often disrupted by wild animals it's right next to a river that floods every single year. We may find nothing, but we've got to make the effort. So uh, for her, hopefully it will bring closure. He has other family members here as well. And he, you know, he has a lot of good mates, uh, ex paratroopers so on and so forth. He wasn't a great friend of mine, I, I knew him but he was a couple of years older than me. So we weren't from the same intake. I think he was about 68, I was 70. So we, we hadn't come across each other previous to, to the Kasinga operation. But that doesn't matter, you know. Uh, you've got to do it for, for whether he's a mate or not. It's, it's, mm. it's not a matter of bringing a mate back. It's a, a matter of bringing a paratrooper back. Yeah, that is an amazing story. And hopefully the conclusion is that you're finding, you bring him back, and it all goes as per the plan, which I'm sure it will. You know what, even if we don't find the remains, everybody will know that we've made the utmost effort to do whatever we can. You know, some things are undoable but we've got to make the utmost effort. And uh, I, I think that although it will be second prize, it means that you've made the effort to bring him home. Yep. That is very, very, very well put. The effort is the, is the critical piece. And then you're right, if it may be second prize, but it still, it has to be done. The effort has to be made. We will now play the last post. This piece of music was originally played in military camps to mark the end of each day and announce that all soldiers should be resting. The last post symbolizes that the duty of the dead is over and that they can rest in peace. During this time, you might like to close your eyes and think about all the men and women who have served in times of war and conflict and about those who have died. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.